Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books and European Politics. I'm Tim Jones, and I'm talking today to Sehi Plochi about the Russo-Ukrainian War, published in May by Alan Lane. Acclaimed by the Financial Times as the world's foremost historian of Ukraine, Professor Plochi is the author of, among other things, the prize-winning Chernobyl, History of a Tragedy, a sweeping history of Ukraine called The Gates of Europe, and a new history of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Nuclear Folly. His new book concludes with this prediction. The Ukrainian nation will emerge from this war more united and certain of its identity than at any other point in its modern history. Moreover, Ukraine's successful resistance to Russian aggression is destined to promote Russia's own, Russia's own nation-building project. Russia and its elites now have little choice but to reimagine their country's identity by parting ways not only with the imperialism of the Tsarist past, but also with the anachronistic model of a Russian nation consisting of Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. Sehi Plochi is the Mikhailo Ryshevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard and Director of the University's Ukrainian Research Institute. Sehi, welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks Thanks for having me on your podcast. Wait, you begin your book, uh, this new book on the war, by deliberately misquoting Churchill as saying, the historians are the worst interpreters of current events except everyone else. But when you said that, I, I remembered something Eric Edelman said six months into the war. He said that, um, why is it that histori- historians have done a better job of explaining this conflict than Russian military experts? So do you agree with that? And is that what you meant by your uh, by your Churchillism? Uh, well, what I meant was that uh, sometime during the first week of the war, I uh, discovered that people... Uh, kept turning to me for for commentary and analysis. And um, a lot of these questions were about history, about the, the road to the war. And uh, I was uh, I was surprised, but I responded positively to this request because I thought that uh, I could, uh, if people are interested, this is my chance somehow to do it. To, to help to, to deal with this situation intellectually, emotionally, and otherwise. And that convinced me that uh, not just I, but we historians as a whole had something, had something to say. And that something is a, a historical perspective. Normally, our wisdom as historians comes from the fact that we are commenting on Monday on the game that was played on Sunday, and we know already the result. And and the, 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 that 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 perspective gives us power. But I realized something that they didn't know before was in the last year, year and a half, that even the game is still going on. Knowing history, knowing where it started, no background of the of the of the people on the field really helps you to not only understand what is happening now, but also to degree predict predict the outcome, not the immediate outcome, but long-term outcome, not maybe the outcome of the game, but certainly the results of the season. Well, uh, before we come to the the, the history, um, you, you give a very personal introduction to the book where you talk about how you were when the invasion began and and, and how you felt. Can you talk us through that? Um, well, I, I was not in Ukraine at the time when war started. I wasn't in the United States where I live now and teach. Uh, I was on sabbatical in Vienna. And um, as news were piling up about the, the potential potential war, major war coming, to, to, to Ukraine, I had this really associations uh, going back to World War II, and uh, of course Vienna was at the center of this uh, early story of the Anschluss. Uh, Vienna was also at the center of the story of the part of uh, World War I, so the, the, those parallels were, were there for me. But still, deep down, I, I hope that, that the war would not happen, or at least would not happen on that on that level. And uh, I had uh, long discussions with my colleagues, including this one of my colleagues at Harvard. And on the early morning in also early morning in Vienna of uh, February twenty fourth, twenty twenty two, I opened my email, and I saw um, an. Headline, not not headline, but the the the, the uh, 
subject line of the email, uh, and it was, uh, my goodness, that's that's th those were the words which were in the subject line. And before I was opening the, the email, I already knew that it it, it, it began. And it's 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 a strange feeling. On the one hand, as a historian, you you, you again you, you look at these preparations, you uh, you comment on that, you comment on different options. So intellectually, you are you are maybe half prepared, but emotionally, certainly, I, I wasn't. I, I wasn't even five percent prepared for what happened. So what's central to the book and to your explanation for the war is the idea set out in the quote I cited at the beginning, where you talk about, uh, quote, Russian, the Russian nation consisting of Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians, this this thing that instills Russian nationalism or Russian imperialist nationalism. Can you take us through the history of how that developed and became such a core of, of that kind of thinking in Russia? Um, in the the nineteenth century that's that's where it all started and began and this is the time uh, not just in the history of Russian Empire but really the history of Europe and the history of the world when empires as I uh, write in my book uh, encounter an enemy that they can't defeat and the name of that enemy uh, is at that time liberal nationalism. So the rise of national movements, the, the foundation, intellectual, cultural foundations for the new modern states have been formed. And the Russian Empire was not an exception from the general rule. So they started they started to somehow fight against this, uh, recognizing early on what a danger it is to the empire. They started to, to fight against those movements. And uh, response to the Ukrainian modern Ukrainian national movement that uh, comes in the 1840s was 20 years later by 1860s formulation an idea that yes maybe Ukrainians speak differently than Russians maybe they dance differently but at the end of the day they're all Russians and the model was introduced of the three-partied Russian nation a very imperial uh, model where the great Russians or Russians, the Ukrainians or little Russians, and the white Russians or Belarusians constituted one big group, a Russian imperial nation that that would would be the core of the of the empire and its transformation to this to this new national era to the new na 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 age of all of nations, and uh, that that concept uh, was very important very influential up until uh, the world war one and then it collapsed in the middle of the world war one collapsed in the middle of the revolution and the bolsheviks who came to power in the former russian empire were able to uh, really bring together the empire and, and stitch it back with the help of of course military force and brutality uh, but also with the help of new internationalist ideology, communism. And they uh, at least provided a formal recognition to Ukrainians and Belarusians uh, as as separate nations. And the uh, independent Ukrainian state, after being defeated by Bolshevik Russia, was integrated into the Soviet Union as a Union Republic, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The same happened with Belarus. And what we have today, and you can see that from the pronouncements of Vladimir Putin, from the ideology, overall ideology of the war, that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people, meaning that Ukrainians don't exist. So you see in all of that return to the old, outdated imperialist uh, visions of Russia itself, Russian nation, but also imperialist uh, visions of dealing with the, the rise of national identities. So it, it's almost like Russia of 21st goes back to the Russia of 19th century and tries to, to, to fix to fix the, 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 the challenge that comes with uh, um, national, national self-determination of the former imperial uh, spaces by using 19th century uh, tools, which is, which is quite bizarre, but the fact that it is bizarre doesn't make it less, uh, less, less tragic. If you look at the news coming from Ukraine, yeah, you, you say um, 
I mean, you talked about how the Bolsheviks gave uh, some some autonomy to these uh, uh, other republics, and of course, Putin has used this as a to, uh, to to support a claim that Lenin was the creator of the modern Ukrainian state. But you argue with this in the book. Uh, why is that? Uh, it's it's. Um, uh... Uh, I, I, I want to, to say a few words about the term argue, um, because it goes to the core of the reaction that was to the publication of that essay by Putin that was called the um, On Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, and in the academic circles that I'm part of, uh, it, it was basically received as ridicule in terms of the, of the argument, in terms of the, of the, of the use of the uh, historical facts, and uh, there were long discussions among us whether actually something like that deserves a response, because once you start arguing with that, you are providing the other side with the with the sort of legitimacy, academic legitimacy that probably other other uh, um, side doesn't that doesn't deserve under the circumstances. So I'm not arguing against against what is being said in that article. I didn't argue back then. I'm not arguing today. Uh, but uh, what I uh, what I want to say is that uh, the uh, response to this vision of um, Russia and Ukraine um, can be provided and is provided not only in discussions and 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 in historical works. But also, it was provided on the battlefield in Ukraine. Very much, this war, its first start and its operations, it was based on the idea that uh, Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people. So, in that sense, the argument on, on, on Putin's side was not just historical; it was, it was something that he believed in existed in in uh, today's world, where the uh, Ukrainians were actually deep down Russians who were um, misled uh, by by the bunch of nationalist Nazis and drug addicts uh, led by uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky. And I'm not making up these terms and words that are all in the, in the official pronouncements, Russian official pronouncements. So the expectation was that uh, good Russians in Ukraine would welcome the Russian troops uh, entering the country with flowers, and they met them with uh, with uh, the with weapons, and keep keep fighting back. Uh, that's uh, the, 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 that's for me the the if if again argument is is the right term. That's that's an argument in its own right. Yeah. It well in your history you you make it. Very clear how pivotal Ukraine was to the to the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and and you quote uh, Boris Yeltsin just being unable to accept that this was a possibility that that the Ukrainians were uh, you know voting in their referendum to 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 leave the the the, the Soviet Union. Um, can you talk us through that? You know what, why it was so important. Uh, to the future of the USSR, that Ukraine was the main republic that, that brought it down. Well, the Soviet Union was dissolved one week after the Ukrainian referendum. Referendum took place on December first, nineteen ninety-one. Uh, anywhere between eighty and eighty-five percent of the eligible uh, voters took part in the referendum. Ninety-two uh, percent voted for independence so it was quite quite quite, quite a decisive uh, outcome uh, uh, but the, the trick was that um, ukrainians uh, didn't answer uh, in the referendum question was not about the future of the soviet union the referendum question was about whether ukraine uh, whether the citizens of ukraine wanted their at that time union republic soviet union republic to become independent but the outcome was the fall of the ussr and uh, Ukraine was the only republic in the in the entire Union that held a referendum on independence. No well, one other held, but uh, Ukraine's vote decided really the fate of Russians, of Kazakhs, of, of uh, uh, many other groups and nationalities in the Soviet Union, because neither Yeltsin nor even Gorbachev 
imagined a continuation of the Soviet project, I mean, Union project, without Ukraine. Uh, and there are the, the, there is a number of reasons for that. One of them is that Ukraine used to be the uh, second largest after Russia Republic of the Soviet Union in terms of population and economic output. So economically for Russia to continue with the, uh, the, the project of the Soviet Union, which in 1990-91 considered the project that required the sort of money that Russia didn't have, so economically, for for Yeltsin to continue with the Union project would be would be a major problem. That's even if you forget about really not happy relationships between Yeltsin and Gorbachev. But there was also another another important factor, and that was the uh, cultural proximity, ethnic, linguistic, um, religious of, of Russians and Ukrainians, because Russians and Ukrainians uh, are not one nation, or not one people, but they belong uh, in, in the mind of uh, linguists and, and, and uh, historians to the category called Eastern Slavs. The, uh, uh, historically, the origins of both countries are in Kiev, the capital of today's Ukraine, uh, and um, religion, the, the Orthodox or Eastern Christian religion, uh, it's shared by the majority of population of Russia and majority of the population in Ukraine is certainly the factor that made uh, Ukraine an important an important factor in terms of the either so, or both Soviet history and post-Soviet history. And um, Yeltsin uh, more than once told uh, President George H. W. Bush of the United States at that time uh, that uh, without Ukraine, Russia would be, as he put it, out uh, outvoted, uh, outnumbered in the Soviet Union dominated by Central Asian republics, which by definition were not East Slavic or Slavic at all, and were not, were not uh, our, mm, mm, Christian to say nothing about, in terms of the majority of their population, to say uh, nothing about East Christian. So all of these factors from economic importance, uh, from the number of the population to the, to the um, uh, historical proximity, of uh, Ukraine to Russia uh, really contributed to the fact that once Ukrainians voted no to the Soviet Union, Russia lost interest in the project, and then the rest of the republics followed, and the Soviet Union fell apart within four or five months after first after the Ukrainian parliament declared independence, and then one week after Ukrainians supported the decision of the parliament at the referendum. It's funny because it, they clearly, even then, saw it as temporary. You, you, you quote an advisor to Yeltsin as saying that when Russia's back on its feet again, everyone will rally to it and the question of a union can be resolved again. So they, they never really gave up. And that sort of thinking, I guess, is the origin of, of where we are now. Uh, I, 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 certainly, I, I certainly agree with that. I think this is this is what happened. Um, when the Soviet Union was dissolved, uh, the leaders of the three uh, East Slavic nations, Yeltsin of Russia, Kravchuk of Ukraine, and Shushkevich of Belarus, so those were the East Slavic republics that before the revolution were considered part of the same nation. So the leaders dissolved the Soviet Union. So the, the, the former members of, of that participants in that imperial model of the big Russian nation got together and they dissolved the Soviet Union, not Slavic and non-Slavic leaders and so on and so forth. And um, this is, this is of course, uh, an, an irony of the situation, but um, and the Commonwealth that they created instead was viewed by Russia as the way to maintain the control of a post-Soviet space. Ukrainians look differently at that Commonwealth of Independent States. For them, that was, as they put more than once, an instrument for civilized divorce. Uh, we know now that the divorce didn't go, uh, ended up to be not civilized at all. But there was, from the very beginning, very different expectations from that organization on part of Russia and Ukraine. And uh, Russia really believed that the, the republics would would come back one day. 
um, even during the first the first um, tenure of Vladimir Putin as the president of Russia at the beginning of the, the century, uh, quite a lot of traction uh, got uh, got to, uh, a project proposed by um, once his uh, patron and 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 then ally. Um, Anatoly Chubais who was also one of the liberal advisors to to Yeltsin, the author of the Soviet, uh, sorry, of the Russian privatization program. So Chubais was writing at the beginning of the century about the Russian liberal empire that would be ruled not by force, not by army, but the economic power of Russia and the power of the of the Russian uh, of the Russian um, um, corporations. That that, that that was his vision, a soft empire. But we are talking here about the, the person who is considered in Russia to be the, the uh, absolute uh, um, the symbol of, of liberalism, of Yeltsin era. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there, there is no really, never was to a degree, a, a disagreement between conservatives and and quote unquote liberals that it has had to be a continuing Russian dominance over the region. Uh, the question was which empire it would be. The, the liberals who the established and maintained and controlled through the economic means and, and soft power, or it would be the one that would remind re remind observers about the, 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 the military empires of the past. And uh, uh, Putin's response uh, eventually since the start of the war in Georgia in 2008, the annexation of the Crimea in 2014, and now the all-out war in 2022 was, was the vision of uh, the, the empire based on the, uh, not just on the threat of the uh, military, uh, military power, but on the actual use of military power. And we are now in the middle of the largest war in Europe since the end of World War II. Yeah. Well, you, you have a chapter on the diverging uh, politics of the two countries in, in, in the time after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you make a really interesting point that you say the Gorbachev era democratic experiment survived in the former USSR's second largest Republic Ukraine. Uh, and why was this? It was because of its regional diversity, the weakness of its nationalism and its competitive politics. So are you are you essentially saying that it was Ukraine's apparent or, or obvious weaknesses that actually made it more of a democratic su success compared to compared to Russia? Um, yes, when you when you look or, and, and people were and I was there as as uh, certainly witness to some of the events in, in 1990 at the beginning of the 1990s there were huge hopes about russian democracy right yeltsin was its uh, it was someone who embodied it <laughs> while when um, people were looking at ukraine there was there was uh, certainly a well grounded uh, concern whether the democracy would would survive there the the former communist members of the communist party the leaders of the communist party were uh, able to position themselves at the top of the state the ukraine was much more conservative in embracing the the economic reforms and so on and so forth uh, but uh, as, as uh, things started developed uh, in the 1990s and then the beginning of the 2000s, it, it became very clear, even before the Orange Revolution of 2004, that the two countries are on, on a very different course in terms of the, their relationship to um, a rising autocracy and, and surviving democracy. Um, in Russia, by 1993, uh, Boris Yeltsin, who defended the Russian parliament, the so-called White House in Moscow, against the Soviet tanks in 1991. In 1993, a little bit more than two years later, he ordered now Russian tanks to fire at the at the parliament. A rewrote constitution created a um, super presidential republic that became uh, became a, a foundation for the sort of power that that Vladimir Putin has today in Russia. When in Ukraine, uh, the, the elites uh, were trying to emulate what uh, Yeltsin had done in, in uh, 
Russia, but eventually realized that they actually couldn't do that, that the population, the, 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 the people of Ukraine would not allow them to do what people in Russia were not just allowed Yeltsin to do, but very often welcomed. And uh, that there is a number of exp- there is a number of explanations to that, and the, one of them are really uh, different historical trajectories of Russia and Ukraine. Uh, despite uh, the uh, not only claims that they're alleged to one and the same people, but also despite some some commonalities in history, but quintessentially the history turned uh, very differently for those two groups. And produced very, very different attitude in those groups towards the the authority, uh, exceptionally, especially with regard to the right of the authority of the regime or whatever regime it is, to use violence against their own people. In Russia, it was very difficult uh, historically uh, to imagine uh, uh, almost anything happening without the state outside the state or against the state. And the the violence uh, legitimized by state was considered to be a, 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 by majority of the population to be a legitimate one. In Ukraine, you see a, a situation where Ukrainian project, national project, modern project, came of course into existence uh, despite the desires of the state against the state and survived in in confrontation with the state. So Ukrainian society really had very difficulty, difficult task ahead of it when Ukraine became independent in 1991. Somehow to to learn how to live in a state which is not an outside, which is not a foreign state, not a foreign force, not a force imposed on you, but but elected on you. So maybe a distant parallel would be with the United States of America, which came into existence out of general mistrust in the state and uh, uh, produced uh, produced eventually, um, despite of all, all, of all challenges, a uh, democracy that, 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 that continues till today. So in Ukraine, you have the same distrust in the state. And uh, that uh, was, of course, came together with the fact that uh, different parts of Ukraine had different, again, historical trajectories. Uh, my Ukraine came into existence out of the um, territory and, and people ruled by three empires, the Russian Empire, Ottoman Empire, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, it became clear in 1991 for that state to survive, to, to, to go on, uh, one had to reach a compromise. So a different political culture emerged, difficult, different from Russia. And when the state was trying to, to, to pull a Russian trick and, and, and send troops against, against the people, it didn't, it didn't stand well for the state. Uh, the uh, Orange Revolution of 2004 certainly insisted on the on the fair elections. Uh, the uh, Maidan protests that became known as Revolution of Dignity in 2013, 2014, uh, chased the president out of the country uh, when the president, under pressure from Russia, refused to sign an association agreement with the European Union. And... Uh, uh, mm-hmm. The, the the one of the presidents of Ukraine, the second president, Leonid Kuchma, who refused uh, to follow um, Putin's you know, advice or demand to use military force against uh, his own people in, uh, during the revolution of uh, Orange Revolution of 2004. He is also the author of the book that is called uh, Ukraine is Not Russian. And according to some accounts, that that was exactly the the, the, the phrase that he used, uh, uh, telling uh, Putin thank you, but not thank you in terms of his his advice to use military force. Uh, Ukrainians uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, just just wouldn't wouldn't accept the sort of behavior that uh, many Russians uh, embrace the behavior of, of the state and. Uh, uh, it, it, it was difficult to predict that in 1991, but then from one year to another, from one decade to, to another, it became very clear that uh, the, the post-Soviet Russia turned out to be a very different uh, state uh, in comparison to post, uh, 
Soviet Ukraine. And at the end, it's not just geopolitical orientations of two countries, but also their political systems turned out to be on the collision course, becoming one of the one of the contributing factors to the start of this war. I mean, you you chronicle Putin's many attempts over the past twenty years to to tame Ukraine, to to really turn it into a nominal independent state, but but something that Russia controls or is or is paralyzed by a super federal system and, and and is neutral. If he could have made that work, do you, do you think he ever would have been satisfied with it? Or ultimately, was this always going to be a, a pure imperialist project over time? Um, the war um, that is going on today didn't start in February of 2022. Yeah. It started in February 2014. Um, that that the, the, the beginning of the war was kind of overlooked, or mostly overlooked by uh, most observers outside of the region. And um, it started over the issue of the uh, association agreement with European Union, Ukraine's association agreement with European Union, something that I just mentioned. Why would uh, Russia annex Crimea um, start the hybrid warfare in eastern Ukraine, in the region of Donbass, um, over the issue of association agreement. It's not membership in NATO, it's not uh, membership in the European Union, it's not even a candidate member status that Ukraine has now, candidate mem member status of the European Union. Uh, and the answer to that is, is um, at least for me, quite clear, and that's that's what I'm trying to say in my book, is that uh, if Ukraine uh, signed the association agreement and it did that, uh, it wouldn't be uh, eligible anymore for membership in the Eurasian Union. And there was a number of very, uh, uh, versions of that union that Vladimir Putin was trying to, to propose and impose on Ukraine. Uh, so the, the the project was, and, and the war started outright uh, out of this uh, empire building or re rebuilding project, because uh, Putin really followed in the footsteps already of the, the Russian uh, politicians and uh, and thinkers of the early 1990s, where the the world was imagined in Moscow, the future world, the ideal world, as a multipolar world not one dominated by, by the United States, but multipolar, and Russia was imagined as one of those poles. One part is China, rising China at that time, and one part is the European Union that was in the process of territorial extension. Um, but to become a pole, uh, there was also understanding that Russia would have to uh, re re reestablish its control in some form. The form was was debated and discussed, uh, but in some form, from liberal empire to a liberal empire over the post-Soviet space. And Ukraine, the second largest Soviet and then post-Soviet republic, was really crucial for the realization of that project. Um, so once Ukraine tries to move um, westward and tries to escape the sphere of influence that Russia considered to be its own, what you get in 2014 as well. Uh, so at that point, it wasn't just about joining, joining any Western institutions, at least in the, in, the immediate, in the immediate future. It was just about signing an agreement that would keep Ukraine outside of the Eurasian Union. That was, at that point, already perceived to be unacceptable. So it is it is a very much imperial imperial project, but it is also, as we know now, uh, had been uh, supported by the by the form of the Russian imperial thinking that comes from the nineteenth century, and we we discussed that before. So empire and this imperial vision of nation is something that uh, again uh, the, the, the the Russia tries to to implement on different in different forms. Uh, since the 19th century, how to reconcile that the, the nation and empire, how to to keep the one sixth of the earth that was acquired by the by by the Tsars up until 1917, how to keep it under control of one center, and at the same time 
uh, and at the same time somehow find a formula to to deal with the with the global processes of the rise of, of national state of, of uh, the rise of the sovereignty of those states so we, we will just look to look at over the in the centuries look at different ways how how they're trying to 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 reconcile empire with nation and the whatever whatever ideas whatever models are out there uh, most of them would lead to and lead to bloodshed but coming to the full scale invasion uh, of last year I and mean, it's clear from your book and from other books um covering the the beginning of the of the invasion that the the kremlin was shocked that the ukrainians didn't collapse you know within days as happened in crimea as essentially happened in georgia in 2008 and that zelensky didn't flee like yanukovych um it just amazes me I mean, how how is it possible that uh, a country that as you as you set out is is two countries that have been so close for so long how did they misjudge um ukrainian behavior so badly and, and how was their intelligence and their spy networks so bad um, well the the it's not just uh, um, the russians didn't didn't misjudge ukraine Mm, uh, before the start, before the start of the war, mm, the the Washington and and European capitals and and Moscow disagreed on almost everything. Uh, but there was one tacit understanding that that Ukraine probably would not survive for more than a few days, maximum weeks. Uh, you can um, you can see that not only from the way how unprepared for that war turned out to be Russia, really with the troops marching in Ukraine with the parade uniforms preparing for a parade on Khrushchev, the the main uh, uh, the main street of Kiev, but also you can see that from the sort of the weapons that um, the West had been sending to Ukraine reluctantly with President Trump trying to get um, political bribes in return for, for those weapons. But the sort of weapons that were there were weapons for the partisan warfare. So if Ukraine would resist, the, 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 the biggest optimists in Washington believed at that time it would not be the state that would resist. The best thing for Zelensky would be to flee Kiev. It would not be the uh, Ukrainian army. It probably would not last for long, but maybe there would be a partisan warfare. And that's that's sort of the weapons that were sent. So Ukraine, Ukraine surprised in, in that sense both East and West in terms of its resilience. And uh, um, one one of the explanations when it comes certainly to the to the Russian side of how you can how you can misread the country so badly is that you become really a hostage, a victim of your own misreading of history and of your own mythology. If you really believe that Russians and Ukrainians are one and the same people, you not only expect that they would not fight back, that it would be just nationalists and drug addicts who would be doing that and a bunch of Nazis, but also that uh, they would react to your use of force in the same way how uh, Russians behave. And uh, that uh, misreading of history, that, that particular type of ideology that we discussed at this point became, at least in my opinion, also a crucial, crucial reason for misreading Ukraine, for misunderstanding and, and making you know, wrong predictions in terms of how, how Ukraine and Ukrainian society will behave, how strong was the state. How strong and determined were the, the, the armed forces, and uh, uh, then uh, Russia, and we talked about that as well. is is not a democracy. It is it is an autocracy with elements of of uh, a dictatorial regime, and uh, in the situations like that, the the intelligence services are bring, bringing the boss the information the boss wants to hear and uh, the boss is very explicit in in saying what sort of uh, frame what, what sort of ideology what sort of expectations he has he, he publishes articles he, he declares speeches so it's it's uh, um, really really a, a case of not only imperial war on the on the russian side 
but also a case of uh, imperial type of miscalculations and uh, the the, um, the the falsehood of, of the imperial mythologies. Yeah, they, they not only seem to have misjudged, um, you know, people in Kiev, but they they have misjudged people that they assumed were their allies. I mean, you make the point that the most acute victims of this war have been Ukrainians in the East and the Southeast, many of whom are Russian speakers and probably would have been Kuchma or Yanukovych voters. Do, do you think there are many or any Russophiles left in the Donbass? Uh, yes. The, 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 who suffered the most in this war were uh, exactly the people who um, Russia allegedly was supposed to save and liberate. And the um, city of Mariupol that uh, was well, almost entirely destroyed, or at least half of the city was destroyed. Uh, before the war, uh, 44% of the population were not just Russian speakers, were ethnic Russians, and the absolute majority were Russian speakers. The second largest city in Ukraine, Kharkiv, that is 40 kilometers plus minus from the Russian border, uh, was bombarded and continues to be bombarded for, for weeks and months. Uh, the, the the largest uh, suburb, uh, the, the largest part of the city, and the, the, the Saltivka is, is completely destroyed, and it's it, it, what I read at least. They say that this is the largest sort of compound of that of that level in Europe in general. Um, so uh, what you hear now from the from the uh, mayors of of um, many cities, including Kharkiv, is that the attitude towards Russia became much more hostile than, uh, uh, in their opinion, is the attitude of the people in Western Ukraine who traditionally were viewed as anti-Russian. Western Ukraine was the place where the um, Ukrainian insurgent army was fighting against the um, Soviet um, armed forces and then Soviet internal troops for six, seven years after the end of World War II. Uh, and the, 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 that, that, that resistance, that, that spirit of resistance to, the, to, 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 to Moscow, to, to, to the Soviet Union, of course, normally because of that is associated with Western Ukraine. So now the argument is made that Eastern Ukraine is actually much more, uh, uh, much more um, uh, determined to, to fight Russia and maybe other regions. Uh, so mm, it's, a, it's a sad irony that this war achieved absolutely, on that level at least, achieved absolutely opposite to what to what was declared, and not only declared, but what was, in my opinion, one of the key, key goals of the war, of uh, 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 liberating uh, Ukrainians from alleged nationalists and uh, uh, allowing allowing Russians to be Russians again. That 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 was the vision. Uh, the the war will have and already has a major impact on Russian Ukrainian relations for generations to come. And if anything, it strengthened um, uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian uh, national identity that is exclusive in relation to Russia and certainly doesn't include include any elements of, of Russian. Um, the Russian uh, identity of today, at least. Well, to, today, I mean, Ukrainians are, are bound to feel very uncompromising, but most wars do end in a compromise. And um, in, in many ways, Kyiv has already more than achieved its strategic aims of, of binding itself to the European Union and NATO, and it's going to be Europe's preeminent military power once the war is over. So... Can you see any way in which there is a compromise that allows some of these lands, particularly if the people who want to live in Ukraine have probably already come, you know, have moved west? There is any way to settle uh, on something like the pre-February 2022 um, lines? Uh, Ukraine's position uh, is that uh, Ukraine wants to go back to the. Uh, it's internationally recognized borders. Yeah, that means the borders b before the um, February 2014. 
right before the start of the war. Um, and um, I don't think there are any historical precedents where the countries would uh, basically say uh, while fighting the war that our goal is not really to liberate the entire country that was violated. And I don't think that that that, that sort of suggestions uh, could be made to to any to any political leaders of of any fighting country. So it's well, I hear a lot of these questions, and what they basically what what, what they imply is that while well, we expect from Zelensky a behavior that you would never expect from our own leaders. Uh, so that's that's that that, that is the first comment. And um, the second is that since the uh, late March of 2022 and uh, the early uh, April of, of the last year, the negotiation track and the negotiations going through March uh, was really was really uh, made made uh, first difficult then completely unacceptable. Uh, because of the of the um, two factors. First of all, the Ukrainians um, discovered that they could fight and they could fight back. And once they did that, they started to liberate their territories. And then came Butcher and the the um, atrocities uh, committed by by Russian troops. And we all know about Butcher, but the liberation of Ukrainian territory continued since March. And uh, there were there, there are much more butchers like that, uh, which really made made the, the negotiation track uh, really really not realistic for today. We are in a situation since in, again for for at least a year now, where the biggest questions of the war are not decided anymore at negotiation table. They're decided at the battlefield. And whatever will be the borders of the future Ukraine, they will depend on what what happens on the front lines. And uh, I don't think this is this is something very specific for 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 the current stage of the war or for this war in general. If you look at the uh, relatively recent history and history of the Cold War, and look at the countries divided. By uh, by borders from Germany to Korea to to Vietnam, again most most of these borders came to existence uh, as as of course an outcome of negotiations and documents signed. The map was decided more than anything else by the movement of the of the forces, and uh, that's that's where we are today in Ukraine. Um, the 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 year started with two uh, big questions about the future of the war. Both of them were related to the uh, military breakthroughs, potential military breakthroughs, not diplomatic breakthroughs. The first question was, what would be the outcome of the Russian uh, winter offensive? And the second, what would be the outcome of the uh, possible Ukrainian counteroffensive? So that was... That those were the questions on January first, twenty twenty-three. We have now answered to the to the first question about the Russian military uh, offensive. They did they didn't get anywhere. We are now awaiting the the potential start and and then outcome of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Once once we get that those results, I think the 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 entire um, Ukraine, the, the the front lines, the, the the world would be in a different place, whatever the outcome of it is, with a place which would allow actually to project for the future, and think also about military track, things about negotiation track, what would be the relation between them. But in the last year, it is whatever happens on the battlefield uh, this will decide the or decides for now the the uh, um, both both uh, political uh, uh, not just military but also the political situation about uh, around Ukraine. I think that's a good place to end our discussion of the book. 
Um, so as usual, because this is a podcast about books, I've asked my guest to recommend a couple, uh, one or two in his field, um, poten- potentially our personal choice. And I should add that um, on a previous uh, interview, Ollie Rain chose uh, Nuclear Folly as one of his. So um, so he, uh, what have you chosen? Well, one of them is a recent book that I reviewed for the Washington Post, and it is written by Olga Onuch and Henry Hale, and it is called uh, Zelensky Effect. And I really highly recommend it because it it, it is a book about, of course, uh, President Zelensky, who is a lot in the news now, who sometimes is called Churchill with, uh, with iPhone, but it's also about the society, the society that produced Zelensky, and it is, it is uh, very important. And uh, another book uh, is not not on Ukraine, not on Russia, but certainly betrays my my uh, uh, interest as a historian. And the book is by Katja Hoer, Beyond the Wall: A History of East Germany. And I read it. I blurbed it with with, uh, with with pleasure. It looks like it's it's doing very well, uh, and and in Britain in particular. So it is. It is the history of Germany, the the place that once exists, and without understanding which it would be difficult to understand today's Germany, including its position in the in the current war and and huge diplomatic crisis that accompanies it. Uh, so these are the, the, the these are the two books that uh, I think the Google listeners can can really benefit from in terms of understanding what is happening today in Ukraine, but also getting in better understanding historically and otherwise of what used to be Eastern Europe. Well, thank you. Uh, neither of those have been uh, chosen before. So um, today I've been talking to Serhii Boki about his book, The Russia-Ukrainian War, published by Alan Lane. Serhii, thank you for coming on. Jim, it was, uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for your questions and for this possibility to present my views on on, on what is happening in this world today. Thank you.